Okay, thank you, Con. So when it comes to mineral nutrition, uh, I can't even see that. I mean, the most common uh, nutrient you're going to deal with is, for most vineyards around the state, is going to be a nitrogen. Again, potassium is a, is a factor. And then the two micronutrients that probably are more commonly found deficient in vineyards would be zinc and boron. Probably less common is phosphorus and magnesium. And then, uh, and, and again, uh, for the micros, uh, iron, magnesium. And then again, some of these other ones are you're gonna, less common that you're going to see these, although occasionally we've seen copper deficiencies in some coastal vineyards, especially on very low fertility soils. And again, sometimes those are more related to young vines and maybe the lack of the ability of those vines to pick up the copper that's present in the soil. Again, the other thing, of course, we have problems with excesses. And some of those are from over-fertilization of, of nitrogen sort of materials, uh, but they also can be from contaminated aquifers. And so uh, we do have some vineyards uh, in some areas that uh, the, the, the nitrogen that's supplied with just the irrigation water exceeds the needs of the plants. And again, we see problems with that. And again, we see problems with, with salinity, uh, whether that's natural in the soil or sometimes it's applied in the irrigation water, and again, as the water evaporates, we get concentration of those elements in the soil that could have a negative effect on the vines themselves, but also have a negative effect sometimes on the plant's ability to pull nutrients out of a soil. And again, we do have soils that have uh, high boron levels or also have water sources that have high boron, and again, uh, those can cause problems over time. <clears throat> Again, boron is kind of one of the interesting ones because it can be deficient, but if it's over applied, you can get yourself into a, somewhat of a, of, a, of, a, of a toxicity type effect. Again, there, when you think about mineral nutrition and how you manage that, there's a lot of factors that need to be considered. Again, uh, one of the main factors to think about is the site and especially the soil characteristics and the, and the soil chemistry and what influence that may have on the vine's ability to pick up nutrients. So do there, does there exist actually elemental deficiencies in those soils? Are those something then that can be amended pre-plant? Or if you didn't catch it, how do you amend those post-plant? Again, that, that the mineral inputs you may put in there are going to vary depending on what your production goals are. So as you have larger canopies, as you develop uh, vineyards that are producing at a very high level, they're going to have <coughs> requirements, nutrient requirements that are much higher than something at a lower production level. Again, you really need to understand uh, what inputs, especially when it comes to nitrogen. It's not what fertilizers you put in there, but what other sources of nitrogen may be in the system. It could be from other amendments you're putting on there. It could be from some of the covers. Do they contribute to the nitrogen uh, sources in, that are, are present? Or, or is there nitrogen in the water? Oh, thank you. And does that have some input? Again, the cultural practices that you have in, in the vineyard. So again, this course is focused mostly on irrigation. Again, kind of our nutritional Inputs and ir ir irrigation practices are kind of go hand in hand these days. Again, how are you going to evaluate that system? And so are you de dealing with deficiencies that need to be made up? Or are you just dealing with maybe supplementing and adding what's being taken out of the system? And so again, we're going to rely a lot on, 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 on tissue and soil analysis to, to kind of gauge and, and maybe uh, make decisions on what that program is going to be. But again, there, there does take a lot of observation and judgment to kind of put that whole package together. Again, as we've moved from broadcast irrigation systems, whether that's furrow or sprinkler, to drip system, we've seen things that were at times not a problem become more of a problem. 
I know on the Central Coast we had a lot of vineyards that were sprinkler irrigated. When I started, most of the vineyards on the Central Coast were sprinkler irrigated. As we moved to drip, especially with those systems sometimes were maybe uh, under-designed and maybe only had one emitter per plant, especially on low fertility sites where that, that bulb was a very small area, a wetted area. We actually saw vineyards that under sprinkler irrigation had no problem, but we, we saw certain deficiencies develop over time, especially things like phosphorus, which is relatively uncommon in vineyards, became more of an issue. And if you reflect back from when the vineyard was under sprinkler irrigation, as they, these vineyards went into drip, they were f mining a very small wetted area. They actually got in a situation where they now needed to put phosphorus on in the previous vineyard that was under sprinkler never needed any phosphorus additions. Again, fertilizers are the way that we supplement and add maybe nutrients that, that, uh, that we need to maintain productivity or to correct a deficiency where that, that, uh, that may exist. And again, probably the most common thing we, we're dealing with in the vineyard situation is the application of nitrogen fertilizers. Again, another way to think about nutrients and their mobility is, is, is how they react in water. And so we have some nutrients, again, nitrate, nitrogen is, is probably one of the more common ones that has very high mobility. Uh, other things, because they're more adhered to soil particles, uh, sometimes become less available. And again, depending on the soil chemistry, some of those nutrients you almost have to apply more to get get a response because, uh, again, because of that absorption of those, those, those uh, elements onto the, the, the clay particles uh, in the soil. Again, uh, the concern with a lot of nutrients is, is especially these days, we're coming under more uh, uh, attention and regulation, is the off-site movement of any uh, fertilizers uh, or just nutrients from, from agriculture into uh, especially natural waterways. And so again, we have the potential movement of nitrates and especially phosphorus. Sometimes this is soluble, sometimes this could be attached to soil particles. And so when, when water's moving off-site, we have the potential of those going into natural waterways. Again, the, another major concern with nitrates is the movement down through the profile and, and, and getting into the groundwater. Again, in California, there's quite a few areas that have ex exceptionally high nitrates in the water. Again, that's from uh, agricultural operations uh, uh, in, in many cases. So again, we're going to focus more a lot on uh, nitrogen because that's the one uh, I think oftentimes we're most concerned about. Again, it is a, an essential plant nutrient. I mean, it's, it's mostly taken up as nitrate, although it can be taken up as ammonium. But again, nitrate's the, the form that's usually in the soil solution is, is most available. And again, this concern, especially in recent years, is it's a problem when it, that either moves off-site or if you're moving it underneath, you know, beyond uh, the, the, the root system after an application, and especially if that's going to contribute to any potential uh, groundwater contamination. Again, when it comes to nitrogen, where is it? It can be coming from multiple sources. There's a, a, a level that's in the soil. A lot of times that's tied up. In, uh, in organic matter or in the biological phase of soils. Again, we have, uh, there is the potential of having nitrates in the irrigation water. And again, it's good to have water tested to know if, if it's present and if it is, at what level it's present, present. And again, we have seen vineyards where at very high levels, oftentimes that over fertilization with just natural irrigation becomes a problem, especially sometimes with young vineyards uh, where we, have, we see excessive vigor and uh, have hard time sometimes to get those vines to, to slow down and, and harden off in the winter time to uh, kind of survive the winter months. Again, what fertilizers are you applying? And then 
what contribution maybe those fertilizers have to other, other things. So we have some nitrogen fertilizers that are acidifying, some are more basic, and again, what's the best fit uh, to kind of avoid maybe uh, developing uh, maybe some pH issues over time. Again, what impact do the cover crops have? So they could actually contribute to the nitrogen pool if you have legumes in that cover crop. You know, kind of have a factor in what that contribution might be. The other thing, they pull nitrogen out of the system. And so they could also compete with vines. And so if you have very strong cover crops, and especially vineyards that uh, you have a lack of maybe uh, adequate shoot growth, they, they can come become a very strong pull from the vines. And you could actually have reductions in both growth and potential uh, productivity. So again, this is kind of the schematic of a, of a nitrogen cycle. So again, it's important to know what are the inputs, and then what are the maybe some of the, uh, the outputs. And so again, uh, what contribution does uh, any cover crop have within that system? And so they can contribute to, uh, to, to that pool of nitrogen in the vineyard. Uh, they could also act as a way of, uh, of, of nutrient cycling. So especially in the winter months, they can pull up nitrates, store that, and then again, that, some of that nitrogen will be re-released re to the vineyard after that crop cover crop breaks down. Again, what amount of fertilizers are you putting in, but also what kind of other amendments you might be applying uh, might contribute to that pool. Again, uh, there's a, a lot of nitrogen uh, tied up in the organic matter sometimes, and again, that generally is broken down by microbes and becomes available to the plant. Again, some of that ammonium is tied up on clay particles, and again, you can have this movement back and forth. You can also have losses, so you can have uh, ammonium, could, could volatize. You, under anaerobic conditions, you could have uh, denitrification of nitrogen fertilizers or just nitrogen in the system. So those are losses to the system that now are, are no longer available to the plant. Again, as we remove a crop, we're removing a certain amount of nitrogen out of the system. Again, a lot of the other material that's grown there, whether it's the covers or the plant material of the vines, as that break down, it breaks down, that's re-released and is put back into the nitrogen pool. Again, it's also important to realize that we have the potential of losing nitrogen out of the system by runoff or erosion. So some of that would be soluble nitrates that are, could potentially leave. A lot of that is, though, on soil particles. So whether that's nitrates or possibly phosphates, you can have a loss there. And, of course, the other concern is the loss of nitrogen through, through leaching of that beyond the root system. And then again, that no longer becomes available for plant uptake. Again, it's important to determine uh, the, 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 the nutrient contents. If you're applying manures and compost, you should have an idea of what percent nitrogen or other nutrients you're applying with those, those materials to have, a, again, a good feel for the inputs into the system. Again, uh, evaluate the well waters for, for nutrient levels. So again, uh, one acre foot with uh, 10 part per million nitrate provides almost 28 pounds of, of uh, nitrate, uh, per nitrogen per acre. And so again, that's a, a fair amount of nitrogen. And so that has been a concern for, for some sites because uh, especially in coastal sites, that may be more nitrogen that really is necessary to uh, maintain uh, adequate supplies within a vineyard. Again, it's important to know kind of where, where the demand for nitrogen, but for other nutrients too. And so again, the big demand for nitrogen, uh, you know, almost uh, maybe 60% or so is used from bud break until uh, till verasion is, is a big growth. Some of that is, is remobilized from the roots to support. But again, of that that reserve isn't there. I mean, it needs to be supplemented to support that 
rapid shoot growth and, and into that early fruit development. So again, the timing uh, needs to, to kind of compensate for what, what the demand of the plant is. And so again, that's the beauty of maybe drip systems. We have the ability to, to do a small split applications to, again, provide uh, or spoon feed uh, nutrients, whether it's nitrogen or other, other nutrients, when they're actually needed for, for the developing canopies and the developing fruit. Again, Daniele talked about this, but again, we are applying, uh, most vineyards now are applying, especially the most of the macronutrients through a drip system. That, that application is only as good as that system, uh, the uniformity of that system. So if you have poor uniformity, you're getting poor uniformity of that nutrient application across a field too. So again, it's really important that those systems are evaluated to again, to, to prove that efficiency of, of, of nutrient application. And again, any faults in the system, whether that's plugging or lines not connected to the day of the application goes out, these are all types of things that uh, should be taken care of on a regular basis, not only just to get better uh, irrigation uniformity, but also because that irrigation uniformity is gonna determine how uniform that nutrient application is also. Again, we're concerned about reducing nutrient movement, uh, especially off-site. Uh, again, whether that's soil and, and nutrients that are attached to those soil particles. I know we've done a quite a bit of, years ago we did quite a bit of cover work, crop work looking at uh, nutrient cycling and also uh, 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 cleaning up or filtering uh, water as it moves out of the systems during winter rains. And again, cover crops can be very effective. And so whether that's, if, if this happens to be a waterway here and, and the, the water moving off-site is going through this filter of this cover, that could be very effective in, in dropping out soil particles and actually cleaning up water. And so there's been several studies on the central coast, whether it's this kind of thing, or even canals that are lined with grasses. It's very effective in dropping out soil particles. In the process, it also cleans up that water. And you have a lower a level of, uh, of nitrates and phosphates in those, those type of waters as they exit uh, the, the, the farm. Again, uh, these covers, even though this is, has a slope here, we, we were shown in our trials, was, even where you had this, if you had, uh, this is the low area in the field, so the water drained from this treated bare soil into the row, middle of the row, and then filtered down this row, again, was a very effective way of dropping out soil particles, trapping those sediments, and in the process, we, that water as it left the field was much cleaner uh, by using those type of uh, practices. As was mentioned before, again, uh, have a good idea when you apply irrigation water or irrigation, what is the depth that that's moving to as you apply nutrients? Again, we don't want to be pushing those nutrients beyond that root system. So again, those nutrients should be applied in a way that they're in the root system and remain in that root system, hopefully to try to capture that uh, prior to being pushing, pushing out. Again. Things like nitrogen that are very mobile, nitrates that are very mobile, quite easy to push those out. Again, on some soils, uh, as you get more sandy uh, soils, uh, again, probably whatever rate of nitrogen you're going to apply over the season, it's best to, to split those out and maybe do short, uh, short uh, smaller doses rather than these big slug type treatments. So again, the other thing you have to decide is what kind of, do you have absolute deficiencies in the soil? So it, it, the, the, the nutrient is actually not present in the soil and it needs to be added, or sometimes we have induced de deficiencies. So that nutrient is present, but, it, but, but the roots aren't able to pick that up. So again, that might be soil pests, such as phylloxera or nematodes, having an impact on on the function of those, that root system and its ability to pick up adequate 
uh, 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 nutrients. Again, we have seen responses then also that the more you kind of spoon feed those vines, the better uh, response you get from uh, nutrient applications. Again, uh, soil status. So again, very dry soils are going to, it's going to be very hard, it's going to be harder for some of those uh, pickup of nutrients because again, a lot of nutrients are moved to the roots through mass flow. Uh, the other op on the other end, as you get very saturated conditions, again, some nutrients are going to become less available. Again, oftentimes these very wet springs, we have wet vineyard soils, especially if they're cold soils. You'll see deficiency type symptoms. It's not really that sometimes the nutrients are deficient, it's a, the plant's inability to pick those up based on saturated and cold type conditions. Again, sometimes there's other elements in, this, in the vineyard uh, uh, soil chemistry that are preventing uptake. Or sometimes you can actually even get uh, over fertilization of, 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 of let's, let's say, like uh, potassium. And on, especially on certain rootstocks, you can then induce or, or see sometimes magnesium deficiency. So again, I've seen that, especially on uh, like a rootstock like SO4, which is a little less able to pick up or a little, seems to always have more issues with low magnesium. If you over fertilize uh, with potassium, we've seen uh, problems with magnesium deficiency. Again, we see differences between varieties and rootstocks. And again, especially sometimes these cold type conditions I've seen with Pinot Noir and coal sites uh, where, again, you'll look across a block of Pinot Noir and you'll see some vines are very yellow, some vines are more normal. Again, some of that's related to that rootstock uh, uh, effectiveness of picking up uh, certain nutrients. Again, crop levels, at the higher crop levels, you, you have higher nutrient demand. And so again, same thing. Sometimes we'll see uh, potassium deficiencies uh, develop in sites where under maybe a lower crop level, uh, you won't see that. So again, with the hopefully that if, when you have high crop levels, you're kind of monitoring those plants and can compensate for maybe that higher crop level by boosting up maybe your, 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 some of your nutrient additions for that season. Again, uh, tissue sample sampling is generally the best way of, of uh, monitoring uh, nutrient status because it, it, it's the one that tells you what the plant's picking up. And again, so generally uh, we think of kind of a, on an annual basis uh, taking uh, uh, levels to kind of gauge where you're at and kind of see, are you adding enough? If you're on a maintenance type system, are you adding enough to kind of keep those levels uh, where you'd like to do? Of course, uh, you could also use uh, nutrient uh, tissue sampling to, uh, to diagnose maybe symptoms that pop up. But ideally, you want to pick up and correct uh, some of these things before you actually see uh, visible uh, deficiency symptoms. Again, soil fertility analysis is probably less effective in telling you what, uh, what you should be adding. But again, it, it is a good indicator of kind of baseline uh, uh, soil chemistry. And again, I think it's good to kind of keep a, a track of what's going on in the soil uh, to kind of have a benchmark to maybe evaluate the site's uniformity. But then also on, an, on a regular basis, to, uh, to kind of, especially in drier sites where you have potential of maybe building up salinity is to, is to monitor that. And again, with the, with the thought that uh, when you see those levels rise, that you maybe then modify your irrigation practices to maybe then to do some leaching to maybe hopefully avoid uh, some of that uh, buildup of maybe salinity type issues prior to them becoming more of a, a, a production issue. Again, because uh, under drips irrigation, uh, if you are taking uh, soil samples, it's very important where those samples come from. So if you're applying nutrients in this wetted area and you're sampling outside that wet area, it's not going to give you the same indication of, of, of maybe or maybe give you a good gauge of, of, of what nutrient levels or, or, or what's changing within that wetted area. And so again, where you pull that sample is very critical. 
Now, maybe sometimes you might want to take this if you're concerned about salinity. You might want to be sampling here, but you might want to be sampling out in the middle of the row and, and, and evaluating those two levels to look at maybe changes over time. So again, when you're looking at salinity, I think it's important to look at the salinity issue. If you have a, sites that you know have uh, some of these issues, whether it's chloride, boron, or sodium, it's good to keep abreast of where, how, what's changing. Again, we do see changes over time in pH, soil pH, depending on what you're adding. Uh, both, if you're adding fertilizers that have a, a acidic effect over time, you can see shifts in that. We also have some vineyards that have very high pH waters, and so again, you can see some shifts uh, due to that also. And again, some of those pH shifts may have some uh, influence on uh, the vine's ability to pick up nutrients. So again, this is a, just a chart showing the nutrient availability based on pH. And so you see if we, ideally we'd like to be something basic or slightly acidic. Gives us kind of the, the best range. And as we become more acidic, you can see that certain elements become less available. Other elements become more available. And so we have seen sites with very low pHs, and sometimes that exists in the subsoil, but sometimes it's uh, even higher up. We can get toxicities due to things like aluminum. And then on the other hand, uh, we see uh, very high pHs sometimes, especially if it's uh, high lime type soils, we'll see then issues with, with things like iron and the iron deficiencies based off of that. Again, the idea is to, to the monitoring of these on a, on a regular basis is, is kind of to make sure you're kind of in this optimum level. So again, to pick up those issues prior to it becoming a problem. So hopefully that either in a new vineyard you're correcting that through amendments, but then in established vineyards that you're picking up, whether it's salt or some other thing that's becoming either too low or excessive, that you and can institute some type of practice to uh, make, make, may make that situation more in an optimal level prior to that becoming a growth and, and production issue. Again, most of our, our sampling has, has been based off of uh, uh, tissue analysis. And again, it's very critical uh, what the time you do that. Again, most of our critical levels are based off of bloom type, bloom time sampling bloom time petiole sampling. And again, this is, is going to give you the kind of, it's probably the best time to kind of determine, give you a feel for where you're at uh, with any given nutrient. But to kind of, if you're on a, some kind of a management or, or a replacement program, is, are you applying enough? Or maybe if you're applying too much, you can back off uh, some of those, those uh, additions. Again, we also have the ability of uh, coming back at verasion and doing a follow-up, maybe at that point to refine, are you, do you have enough potassium in the system? Obviously, you then an, uh, an ability to add some more if, if needed. And again, uh, again, we can use tissue sampling also to diagnose maybe problem situations. And again, maybe if you're look concerned about uh, toxicities, uh, you're going to look at maybe some blade blades to, uh, to, to look at kind of what might be accumulating and causing issues. Again, the, the time that you, especially when it comes to nitrogen, the, 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 the values you get change over time. And so again, it's very important that those samples are taken on a consistent basis uh, on bloom or veration because that's going to give you a, a feel for where you're at. And so again, typically we, at bloom time, we're taking petioles opposite a cluster. So that's a, a full bloom. So that's a defined uh, phenological point. And so that gives us the best gauge to kind of evaluate where we're at. We will see, you will see fluctuations from year to year. Uh, and you'll also see fluctuations if you take those earlier or if you take them later. So again, but again, that is the, the, this is the point where we do have some critical levels uh, developed, and so it gives you the best gauge for evaluating the mineral nutrition of vines. 
Again, at Verasion, again, it, it's, we're taking, uh, again, a very similar type sample where we're going to take maybe the first fully sized, uh, fully expanded leaf back from the shoot tip. And so again, that gives you uh, some, some a defined a growth point to, to again, to make kind of yearly uh, evaluations or, or, or comparing uh, the same type of tissue from year to year and from site to site. Again, uh, well, we kind of talked about that, but again, We can also use tissue sampling when you see things out of the ordinary, and so that could be uh, any time of the year. And sometimes we see this in the springtime. <coughs> the things like uh, that appear to be uh, a potassium deficiency could be uh, like spring, what we call a spring fever, or is more of a physiological disorder. Uh, and so again, you can determine whether that uh, is is true to potassium deficiency, or 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 uh, a spring spring fever based off of, uh, of, off of tissue samples. Generally that happens in the springtime, so you hopefully you're, then your, your bloom type sampling would, would give you an indication if you have a true deficiency or, or if it's just uh, something like spring fever. Again, the, the amount of sampling should kind of reflect a lot of things. It should reflect the variability you have within the vineyard as far as soil variability. Again, uh, you're going to see differences in varieties on what kind of numbers you get, especially when it comes to nitrogen. And again, we see in some sites, we see some uh, uh, differences in rootstocks also. So again, for general uh, nutrient, we're looking at nitrogen. Again, total phosphorus, total potassium, zinc boron. And then again, some of these other uh, elements are more kind of a toxic, whether kind of trouble diagnosis, looking for, uh, for, uh, for especially for toxicity uh, that may occur uh, on the site. So it gives you a feel for our, our, our salts building up or some of these other things becoming an issue. Again, when you add fertilizers, uh, There is a point where you're going to add, and, and hopefully that's going to give you a response. Uh, and then there's an optimum level where, as you apply more, then you're not going to really get any growth response or yield benefit. Um, but maybe you might have some negative consequences as far as uh, environmental issues. The more you're supplying excessive nitrogen, is that nitrogen staying in that system? Is it getting moved out of the site or out of the root zone? Uh, and again, especially with nitrogen, we can also, or other elements too, we can get to the point where there, you've applied excessive amounts and it's going to cause some adverse uh, effect on plant growth or, or yield. So again, ideally, you'd like to be keeping in this zone right in here. So again, these are the, the, the kind of established numbers that we've used in California. Uh, again, for most of the nutrients, uh, they work pretty well. I mean, nitrogen is the exception. These levels were built were based off of Thompson seedless, and so again, uh, what works for Thompson seedless, it's it's different for other varieties, and so that's always been a, a problem. Is we don't really have critical levels for each variety, and so it would take a lot of work to to do that. Uh, this one in yellow is one is for total nitrogen petioles, and so this is one that. Uh, some people use is around 0.9. There's probably a range there. Uh, but again, most of our critical levels uh, with nitrates uh, or nitrogen, nit nitrate nitrogen has have been based off of uh, nitrate nitrogen, not percent. There's also some people now looking at leaf blades or whole, whole blade analysis. And again, that's going to be another number. I think the critical part is kind of figure out what that number is for, for, for your site. Um, so I know I, I, Larry Williams says it's 200. 200 or below, huh? 150. Okay. So I, there are sites, I mean, I've seen samples before and they come in at 50. And so there have been, and you look at those vineyards, they, they look like they're growing okay, but you kind of question sometimes is that an error in, in sampling or is that 
the real thing, and is that maybe time to maybe boost that up? And so, again, if you're seeing good production and it's you've got low numbers, maybe you're okay. So again, you have to kind of look at the canopy and look at the production. Is the production holding, or or, or the flower numbers staying consistent? And so again, that's where the judgment and evaluation come into be into play. Is, is again. Uh, there could be a lot of fluctuation in this number, especially if you're taking those samples at different phenological points. If, if you're one year you go in at 25% bloom, the next time you go in at fruit set, you're going to get vastly different numbers. And so again, uh, again, I think there, 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 there's a lot of interpretation that goes into looking at, at these, especially nitrogen. The other nutrients seem to be pretty good. So again, we're going to see uh, differences by cultivar, by region, and there's going to be the influence of weather and year in here. And so you see a lot of fluctuation in these from year to year, probably less so with some of these other elements. Again, we've used nitrate nitrogen in California for many years. Some people now like to use uh, total nitrogen in petioles. And again, uh, there's been some work up in Oregon where, at least for Pinot Noir, they're looking at, at, uh, at uh, whole blade or, or leaf blades. And there's people in California looking at leaf blades too. But again, uh, the reason why petiole nitrate nitrogen was used, because especially on some of the studies, especially where there was, um, if you looked at nitrogen rate studies, the petiole nitrate nitrogen appeared to give maybe the, the more, uh, maybe more range in, in, in separating out some of those treatments than, 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 than total nitrogen. But again, I, I frankly don't have a lot of confidence in some of those numbers. I think it, you have to kind of determine what works best for your situation. The main thing is to be consistent. So again, I think especially when it comes to nitrogen, you have to evaluate the vine vigor. Do you have adequate vigor? Or do you have too, too much or not enough? And so again, if you've got really high vigor, maybe there's plenty of nitrogen in that system and you can cut back. Again, you have to think about the cultural uh, requirements of, uh, of, of that variety or cultivar and the site. Again, we know that rootstock can influence nutrient uptake. Uh, we've seen this in, in when we've looked at uh, rootstock trials and looked at nutrient levels, we do see difference in some of the elements. Some seem to be uh, always consistently higher. Uh, again, we also see some issues, uh, especially with varieties. And so some varieties seem to have much higher nitrate levels than others. And so again, you have to factor that in into your, to, into your uh, evaluations. Again, it's very important to know what the inputs are whether that's from um, uh, fertilizers, whether that's natural amendments or synthetic fertilizers, what input the water has, whether there's nitrates there or not, and then again, what impact the cover crop has. Again, the, the soil itself and the conditions of those roots, if you're in areas, again, we've had some talks earlier, if you've got your, your irrigation practices, especially if you've got some kind of restrictions in water movement and you're stacking water, and rotting out part of the root system, uh, it's not going to be, that root system is not going to be as, as effective in picking up nutrients at those lower levels than if that root system was healthier. Again, I, we do you think uh, that the use of tissue analysis is probably the best to detect stream values and trends over the seasons. So again, Probably the best way to look, at, especially if you're in a maintenance system, is to think about what's being removed and, and what you need to replace. And so especially in nitrogen, where for every ton of fruit you're taking out, you're going to be taking off three pounds of nitrogen. So again, is that, that could be used as a, as a budget. Same with some of these other nutrients. Is if you want to put back, you kind of want to put back in what you took out especially in areas where, it's, it, where, where uh, generally there's not other strong deficiencies exist in those soils, that might be a system that works best for you to kind of then maintain productivity uh, of that field over time. So again, timing, 
This is actually an old slide, but again, uh, spring, you have to have, the, the, the uptake is going to be a function of, you have to have canopy there to get uptake, and so you don't want to apply too early, because you may then wash some of that, uh, or, or that, that, especially when it comes to nitrogen out of that system, prior to that vine developing adequate canopy to pick that up. And so sometime, maybe uh, four to six to weeks, maybe four weeks after bud break, depending on how fast your shoots grow, to uh, it might be the beginning. And again, how many applications are really going to be based off of maybe the site itself. Probably you want to avoid uh, high rates uh, close to bloom. Uh, certain varieties have a tendency then to pick up too much nitrogen. It can become a factor in reduced set if you have excessive uh, nitrogen uh, uh, during the bloom period. Uh, but again, so it, it sometimes it's best to apply, especially when it comes to nitrogen, increments over time to get to hopefully the best chance of picking up that nitrogen and, and maintaining it within the, the vineyard system. And again, retention is a problem in, in, in many of our soils, and so especially a site like this is very rocky river bottom soil. There's almost uh, very little retention of nutrients. And so again, there's a big advantage to applying nutrients in very small increments and spreading them out over the course of the season versus maybe a site that has heavier clay soils, maybe requires less irrigation. And again, you're gonna have maybe better retention of any applied uh, nutrients in, in, in that type of system. So with that, I'll stop, and I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions. And we do have other people in the room that I've worked a lot on uh, nutrient issues. You're not allowed to ask questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Yes. I've got some blocks that show spring fever every year, um, but they're not necessarily the areas of more saturated soils. Um, and some of the blocks that do have very saturated soils don't show spring fever. And petiole analysis doesn't throw up any red flags. Are there any other factors that would contribute to that? Well, that's actually, it's, a, it's, it's not, you know, when you see that symptom, it's actually a buildup of putrezine that causes that symptom. And so, I'm not sure if we, you know, look at Rhonda Smith over there, she's the one done a lot of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's consistently in the same block? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a certain variety, a rootstock combination? Uh, sometimes? Yeah. 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 In some cases, the same variety in two adjacent blocks, yeah. and one will have it and one won't. Right. So that's, it's common sometimes to see it in 
some blocks on a regular basis, sometimes it's related to weather in that given season. So sometimes you'll see it and you won't see it again for a while. But it is common to see it in one variety and not the other. Yeah. Oftentimes people see that and they think they have potassium deficiency, apply potassium. So, I mean, that you can separate those out, whether it's actually, you know, the, the physiological disorder versus a, a true deficiency by tissue yeah, analysis. Yeah. Yeah, generally they grow out of it, so. Yeah. Yes, Larry. Also, I'm of the opinion that the values that Steve Richardson came up with now for Zealus are very conservative. So if you have 500 parts per million nitrate of glutamine, there's no problem with yeah. having a deficiency there. Yeah. You do not need to apply it for life. Right. I'm also of the opinion that you can probably even go less than that, maybe yeah. down to 200 and not more. Right. Right. But I think that's across all right. cultivars, all rootstocks, you can yeah. do that. So a lot of our, our critical levels were built on high production systems in the San Joaquin Valley. And as we moved into coastal areas, you probably don't need that level of fertility, especially if you only have a couple tons per acre. And so that's why I always say it takes a lot of judgment. And so to me, it's like the baseline, if everything looks good, sometimes using a budget system where maybe you're going to kind of put back what you took out is the best way to look at it. Yes, Rhonda. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very difficult when you've got a six-week bloom, what do you call full bloom? Because by the time you get to full bloom, you've got stuff from fruit set to not even bloomed yet. So it's not like San Joaquin Valley where you've got sometimes in a warm air, you've got two-week bloom, pretty tight bloom period. That actually is probably the best way, but uh, you, then you have to decide consistently a starting, a starting date. So you have to pick, okay, what's, is it going to be bud break, is it going to be 50% bud break, whatever, and, and then go deep to greed rates. That's probably the best way to do it. And then Larry Williams has done some work looking at exposed leaves versus shaded leaves, time of the day, and there can be some influences there also. So again, you have to be consistent. And so that is the great difficulty, especially in coastal situations, because there's so much variation from year to year and how that bloom develops. I know I've done a lot of tissue samples over the years, and, and, and when you look at a site for a number of years, it, the numbers are vastly different from year to year. And so that's why, to me, it's like, what is a critical level? I'm not really sure for, for nitrogen. For the other elements, it looks pretty, it, it's, I think, more stable. But nitrogen especially is, fluctuates quite a bit. I did work with Pete Christians and we did uh, some fertilizer studies and I mean it's it's questionable sometimes you know the value of sometimes the, of, of of tissue sampling when it comes to uh determining when one's enough and one's one when is it deficient. It's tough to pick up. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you.